Well, I'm going to try and preach as if that didn't happen. <laughs> You've totally uh, thrown me off there, but thank you very, very much. Okay, so I set out a lesson on a need for an urgent spirit. Come on. So here are some quotes on urgency that will ring a bell in most of our hearts. Urgency is getting a lot done in a short period of time in a calm manner. Either you have a sense of urgency today or a sense of regret tomorrow. Without a sense of urgency, desire loses its value. Move fast. A sense of urgency is the one thing you can develop that will separate you from everyone else. So do things now. You may not have later, but you have now. Why do tomorrow what you can do today? Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when it's done. That's a Michael Williamson one. Unless you develop a sense of urgency in your life, what could be will be forever far away. The most successful leaders in life not only have courage and vision, they also have a sense of urgency. They are not willing to wait. They have a burning desire to get things done. Everyone expects us to have a sense of urgency on life's big things, but life measures us on how urgent we are on the little things. People hate to be pushed. That's why the pushy succeed. That's mine. <laughs> Everyone, yeah. Everyone, every moment you waste is a moment you can never get back. And here's one that's super relevant to us, which is really the parable of the sower. Do you get to weak people and problems before Satan does? Matthew eleven twelve. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Point number one, Jesus made things happen immediately. This is not just some nice concept. We're called to be Christ-like. So Jesus healed people immediately. Immediate action breathes faith into people. That is the job of a disciple, to breathe faith into people. The unrighteous are faithless. We are to have faith and breathe it into people. So Matthew 20, 33 says, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. To be Christ-like is to do things immediately. Mark 5, 41. He took her, that's Jairus' daughter, by the hand and said to her, Talath Kulum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And this they, at this they were completely astonished. You know, doing things quickly is so unusual in this world that it astounds people. But it's something that everybody can do. You know, I think about uh, even situations we're studying the Bible with at the moment. We had a situation this week, you know, we're studying the Bible with someone and uh, then we, you know, for many weeks and uh, got a text back going, that's it, don't want to get with you anymore. How would you respond to that? I called up his closest relationship and said, you need to get around there right now. Right now, leave your meal, get around there right now. And it was better in this situation that that person did it than me. Why? Because it's only going to get worse. Yeah. A bad situation doesn't get better, it gets worse, unless you get in there. And as a result, they went round, there was tears, there was this, but then, you know, the heart is either getting harder or softer. That's the truth in our life. So we need to get in there and deal with situations. You know, people are actually begging to have their problems dealt with. But they so often lack faith to deal with them. That's why we need to get into their lives immediately and help them overcome their lack of faith, just like Jesus did. People are crying out, going, God, I need help. And we are meant to be the tools that actually go in and help them. Yeah. Mark 1.40, a man with leprosy came up to him and begging him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and it was cleansed. You know, Jesus was ticked off that this guy thought he wouldn't 
help him. Does that make sense? It needs to tick you off when you see people in need and nobody does anything in need. You need to get ticked off at yourself if you don't respond quickly. I hate, absolutely hate, seeing people in trouble and no one stepping in. I hate it. I remember coming, we were driving down from Birmingham, three hours down to London. We got out of the car, and because I'm cheap, you know that. We parked in, in a car park in like um, Coles to get the train all the way in. And we're walking between there and the train station. And there's this big guy beating up this like 12 year old. You know, most people will walk the other way. I went, I get off him! I'm going, I went, run! <laughs> The whole staff of that, it was just natural for me. Why? I hate it when people don't get involved. Yeah. People are like, oh, it's not my problem. It's not. Well, if it's not your problem, whose is it? Yeah. We are meant to be like Christ. We are meant to put ourselves between their problem and them. Right. Yeah, it gets tough. One of the ones, and I like throwing people under the bus, especially if they're friends that can't even wear pants to church, Solomon. Um, oh. uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, we had the January retreat. It was a great retreat to start off the year. And we, you know, you pour your life in three days, you're preaching and you're giving to people and everything. And then right at the end, I can't remember, I think it was Ashley came up to us and said, Solomon wants to fall away. I'm like, great. <laughs> We've just had three days of inspiring and Solomon wants to fall away. <laughs> I was dead tired. So I got with him. But the temptation is to go, I'll stuff him. I mean, yeah, in my heart, I was like, really? If you want to see how that goes for you, okay. But I'm like, that doesn't help. So I said, okay, you know, drive back, have to give the kid, but I was like, okay, come round and pray with me. So I take him and Brian and we go up by, uh, by Marubra and we just pray because the Bible talks about how David found, uh, uh, Jonathan helped David find strength in the Lord. Yeah. And so, you know, I went out to pray with him and I was obviously being unspiritual, so I said, I'll start. And then I started praising God. and said, you need to imitate me. Praise God, okay. Then, you know, but I spent hours praying with him, just sitting on the beach, yeah. trying to soften his heart. It's late at night. I'm going, okay, how about you stay and just pray with me tomorrow morning? So he stays. Get up with him in the morning with Brian. We go out and have another long prayer. Then I take him for breakfast. And after breakfast, goes, so what do you want to do? He goes, yeah, I'm an idiot. I need, just, I need to repent. <laughs> but if I had left it a day, right. Solomon wouldn't be here. He wouldn't be. You see, that's how important being immediate is. Come on. You know, dealing with people's issues inspires loyalty and fellowship. It is the key to converting people. When somebody says, no, I don't believe what you're teaching, I don't care what they say. That's not what they really mean. Luke 18, 41. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Here we see that, you know, doing things for people immediately means they actually want to follow you. If you're a Bible talk leader, do people want to be in your Bible talk? They should want to be in your Bible talk. I do really appreciate the compliments. But if you don't want to be in the church I'm leading, there is something wrong with me. That's the truth. You've got to understand that. People go, people don't like me, follow me, want to be my friend. Why? You've got to put, I've had that said about me. You've got to put that on you. You know, why is Solo loyal to me? He is loyal to me because of those things. I think that was a major contributor. You know, um, so when we needed to move out a moment's notice from our house, Solomon had to start work at nine o'clock, but he was there for an hour to help me move out. And I appreciate that. Yeah. But what you put into people is what you get back. Right. That's just the truth. Jesus dealt with people's sins immediately. You know, there is the obvious sin that everyone deals with. And then there's the sin that you know of, but so often do not deal with in the hope that it just goes away, which it never does. Jesus dealt with sin immediately, and he knew sin left undealt with only grows. Mark 2, 3. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it 
and then lowered the man mat on the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now the teacher of the law was sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew this in his spirit, that, that, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or say, get up and take them out and walk. Jesus saw the sin in their heart, on their face. If you see people unhappy at church, you go and deal with it. Yeah. If you see somebody not singing, you go and deal with it. Mm -hmm. If you see somebody going into the bathroom and you're living with them brothers and you think they're masturbating, you knock on the door and go, what are you doing? Yeah. Come on. Why? Because it's not going to go better for them. It's better that you embarrass yourself and stop them doing it than they embarrass themselves before the Lord. You've got to be bold. I've got no problem in calling people out to a decision that they made. If somebody said, Jesus, Lord, you should never be embarrassed about calling them to follow the Lord. Yeah. You know, when I got to Manila, um, so I was doing the opening speech to all the, the, the speakers. So if you're visiting, I went to a conference with Kerry a, a week or so ago. And right before Kip, who is my mentor and leader, leads the churches, came up to me and said, I've got some issues for you. So like, oh, great. You know, you know how I don't like last minute things. But when he said, he says, you know, this one brother, you need to get with him. You need to get with him. I think you're a mature man. You can get with him. So straight after the meal, I said, honey, I've got to go with this brother. And, um, you know, that's a bit awkward. I had to leave uh, um, Kerry with uh, Dean in India and Dean lost it. But that's another story. Totally. All right. Um, but anyway, so I get in the car with this brother. And I said, bro, we need to have a chat. And obviously I used to lead the Manila church with Kerry. So it's uh, and, you know, his wife had been in a different country and he's not calling her to repent and change. I said, bro, I love you, but I've heard this about what's going on. I said, right, we need to phone up your wife right now. I said, what? I said, we need to tell her to move tonight and come to the conference tonight. I said, what? I said, you're not allowed in the hotel until you've done it. <laughs> he said, what? And then Bladdy and Shella, who leave Cambodia, were in the back giggling. <laughs> because they're like, <laughs> Joe's back. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I said no, and said he came in, came in, you know, parked his car, and said, "Have you done?" No, get on it. And then he started talking to his wife. I said, "Hi, I'm Joe." She said, "I know." I said, "You need to get on a plane tonight. Come here." She's like, "What?" I said, "Then you know." But I was on it for the next days and continued to be on it. He said, "Well, let me go and think about that." But you've got to see a moment and go. You know, if I was asked to do something by Kip and he thinks I'm the man to do it, you get in there and you get it done. Yeah. All right, that's what we need to. Think about, uh, and this, we haven't sort of shared all the good news that came. Heather, who was in the AMS with us. So again, we got with the leaders of the AMS, which is the Arts and Media and Sports Ministry. And they said, oh, there's this Heather. We want her on staff, but she doesn't know if she wants. She's thinking about next year. So I called her on the back of the bus after we've um, got, got with all the kids at Mercy. I said, uh, I used the James Brown. I said, do you see the light? He goes, what light? The light of going in the ministry. <laughs> you go, why? He said, why aren't you going in the ministry? Everybody thinks you go in the ministry. Well, you don't understand, and you know, well, maybe in January. I said, think of all the people you can save between now and January. Yeah, I know, well, you know, I'm scared of being poor. So I'll give you the money. Just, just hammer every objection, every objection. And by the way, your, your conversation with me about the poverty in Oakland really helped me to then be able to pass on to her and stuff. And so she's now going in the ministry. Come on. You've got to make the opportunity. Think about when Cambodia split. Many of you have been with us. You remember when it split? Packed the bags, off we went. Resolved it. Now, as a result, we have a complete mission team in there. We have an orphanage in there. Those people whose family nearly split off from the church, all of their kids, every one of them has been baptized into yeah. Christ. Oh. That came from what? You giving your extra 30,000 special contribution, and then God went, oh, you've got some spare money. Great, thanks. We'll have that. Throw that over to Cambodia. Yeah. But do you understand how urgency changes things? Yeah. Not only that, at the conference, somebody initiated with us from Burma, Myanmar, yeah. came over to the conference. We studied all the way, by, way through them. He's a minister of a Pentecostal church in Myanmar. We converted them, and now we have a church in Myanmar, and he's studying with the whole family. Because yeah. we acted as a movement quickly. You know, you've got to deal with people's sin immediately. Just a little tip here. 
you can deal with some people's sin publicly like I do, if they're Solomon or, you know, amen. <laughs> Basically, if they want to be a leader or, or they're proud like these people. But in general, you publicly encourage and privately rebuke. Yeah. Okay, so don't try and pick on Solomon. That's my job. Okay. <laughs> Jesus went after people's sin and didn't ignore it. Right. Jesus dealt with people's sinful mindsets by showing them examples from their own life about their hypocritical mindset. So even this in passage in Luke 13, basically the Pharisees goes, Hey, you can't heal on a Sabbath. He went, Really? Your donkey falls in a ditch and you go and get the donkey. You go, Oh, yeah. He wasn't afraid to go just because somebody comes back to you. you know, so many people challenge me, go, bro, you just want me to go in the ministry. I go, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you don't back off. Well, bro, you just want me to go to China. Absolutely. Well, you just want to date, date some spiritual sister. Absolutely. I'm not going to apologize for my agenda. My agenda isn't obvious to people, then it's not a proper agenda. It's a secret. There were no secrets with Jesus. Come follow me now. We're saving the world. Okay, it's immediate. People use all sorts of excuses not to do things immediately. Jesus broke through people's excuses to free their minds and hearts from simple thinking. You know, Luke 14, 2, it says, There in front of him was a man suffering from an abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts, Thought, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Taking hold of a man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked him, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls out into the well of the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? They talk about even a child. Jesus gets to the pointy bit. You know, we need to be urgent. We need to not be apologetic about being urgent. Um, God expects us to deal with our own sin immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Between us and others, Matthew 5, 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Let me just encourage you. We're going to about to have an incredible Women's Day. I think there are 130 commitments done. It's going to be a great. Are you going to be going to that meeting as a non-Christian? If you haven't forgiven somebody in here and you die tonight, you're going as a non-Christian. The Bible is very clear. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. You do not want to go into that meeting with something on your heart towards somebody. You need to deal with it tonight. It may be seriously embarrassing, but you need to deal with it. One of the stories of, of, of Manila, and I appreciate the guy's heart in sharing it, there's a minister from Hawaii, and it was all public, so I can share it. But he basically talks. He said, you know what? What I'm going to talk about is really embarrassing, and my wife is in the other room, and she's going to be sharing it too. He said, before I was a Christian, I was a virgin. I became a Christian as a virgin. Dated my wonderful sister. He said, but when we were dating, we fell into immorality. And I, we didn't confess it. And I was in the ministry, and he said, about five times I heard st talks about confess. He said, I just didn't do it. Uh, but, and I knew I was in the ministry and nothing was happening in the ministry. And I was like, I was just like powerless. And I knew it. There was, there was just nothing coming out of me. And he said, I didn't want to confess it because I thought that maybe I'd be taken out of the ministry and God wouldn't use me and all of this sort of stuff. And he said, it was seriously embarrassing. And eventually I got the courage to confess it. Of course, the exact opposite happened. <coughs> God used me in the ministry. People forgave me. You know, they didn't butter me up on my sin, but I moved on and now things have gone great. You know, we've got to deal with our stuff between us and God as well so that we can move on. Yeah. How serious does God expect us to deal with our sin? Well, we studied the book of Acts, didn't we? Acts 12, 21. Talk about Herod. It says, on that appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And was eaten by worms and died. How quickly does God expect you to deal with your sin? Seriously quickly. Yeah. Especially if you are meant to be in a position where you set the standard. You know, you think God will deal with your sin? 
won't deal with your sin. You can't run away from sin. Two things you can't run away from. You and God. Yeah. You ever notice that? People go, well, I feel like I'll do better spiritually if I'm in Auckland. And the problem is, bro, you're going there with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like God will bless me more in Auckland. He's the same God in Auckland as he is in Sydney. Right, right. Running away never does it. You want to learn to deal with it deeply. Yeah. One thing I've learned as a Christian, you've heard me preach this a lot. If you've got a problem in your heart, go and deal with it tonight. And I mean, go deal with it tonight. If you need to pray all night and all day tomorrow, I'd rather hit Friday absolutely dead tired and spiritually good than I would sleeping well and spiritually bad. Yeah. And sometimes there are nights, you know, I appreciate June. June said he was studying the Bible with, I think, Tong last night. He said, you know what, I don't really know what I'm doing studying the Bible, but the thing that changed me was doing an all-night prayer. So after I started with Tong, I said, Leo, let's go for an all-night prayer with Tong. Yeah. Okay, let's go for an all-night prayer. Yeah. There's a guy who goes, I really don't know what I'm doing. And by the way, even when you lead a church for years, you still don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're like, you know what, it worked for me, let me get him in front of God. On, There's a sense of emergency there. Yeah, come on. Um, uh, point number two, because I've got to cut it short, because you all loved me. Amen. All right. <laughs> God is looking for disciples who do things immediately. So the Bible records the disciples that God wants us to imitate. Disciples who respond to God's calling immediately. So <clears throat> there are many of these in the Bible. But Matthew 4, 18, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. <clears throat> if you're here as a non-Christian tonight, let me just encourage you. We believe there's not an urgency to becoming a Christian, and I believe it's because we're in the first world. Right. You all honestly expect to live to your 30, 40. If you don't know, we bought a house six weeks ago, yeah. and we've been saving up and doing everything right, and I have never been in debt in my life except for once when I was like 14. I mean, I have a big thing about that. Bought the house, set it up well. Six weeks we've owned that, 500 and $80,000 mortgage, and the thing is falling down. That's it. Financially, ruined. Pete has always been in debt more than me until now. Now I'm in double your debt, <laughs> triple your debt. So, amen. So I know how you feel. And you're looking there going, what the? You haven't got a clue what's happening tomorrow. Yeah, you don't. I can predict this. Next five years, one of you will be dead. Just numerically. Just numerically. Wow. That's not because I'm a prophet or anything. That's just numerically. One of you will be dead. That could happen in five years or it could happen tonight. So if you're lost, get saved quick. Because you're not guaranteed it. You're not. You know, I appreciate people who have this heart. Um, I think about Jar Jar. I may have shared it, but when we had the, when we had the uh, Chinese meeting, she just missed, missed happy suddenly goes all sad. I go, why are you sad? She said, well, I've got four more years at university and I need to get to China quicker, so maybe I just need to change my course and get back to China to save the people quicker. Wow. There's the urgency. You know, and urgency impacts people. So when we're moving house, right, we, um, basically, I want to commend everybody that was moving. We were the only happy ones, okay? But uh, we got notice... Uh, on Thursday, a uh, Monday afternoon, Kerry phoned me up and said, we're going to have a notice, it's going to fall down, we need everything out. So what should I do? I said, I'm overwhelmed, give, let me give you five minutes. Put the phone down, sit there, pray in my head, God needs to do this, right, let's go. Was able to organise storage, was able to organise a van, all the guys, phone Manny, etc. like that. What's amazing is, is that that really had a big impact on everybody who were there. First of all, we were doing something. And when you're doing something, you're happier, okay, than when you sit there with a thumb. And everybody noticed it. And Chris, who's the building manager, just said, this is mind-blowing, man, you are so proactive. We were there, so we got the unit. We got the van for free. We got there early, so the lift that everybody has to put it in and out, we were able to get everything out. 
Then, because they saw our urgency, the guy at the storage guys, there's an old guy stuck in uh, flat 77. He needs boxes. Will you please help? So we take them boxes. Then they go, well, there's another person. In other words, when they see people acting quickly, they go, you know what? If there's a problem, I'm going to give it to them. Yeah. My dad always used to say this. If you want something done, give it to a busy man. Yeah. Why? Because they'll get it done. Yeah. A lazy man won't. Yeah. But it has an impact. Then the person we found out, you know, I came back, I gave it to Nicole to phone up. Just so happened that the couple that we needed to give the boxes to were Chinese Filipino. They said, well, who's this friend of yours? They went, oh, I'm Joe's friend. Oh, we've all heard about Joe. I ain't got a clue who this guy was. But immediate joy dealing with problems has an impact and goes all the way around. They even stole our trolley that you hire. But I thought, I need to be godly in this. I go, you know, I went to speak to the bill. Somebody's most probably got it and they're under stress. Can I get it back, etc." But then dealing with situations quickly means they don't get bigger. Yeah. You know, you've got to understand that you must learn to respond quickly to God, to his needs and to his calling. Why? If you do, then you can then end up helping other people. True. You know, disciples who did not delay in bringing issues before God. So in Mark 1, 29, it says, as soon as I left the synagogue, so this is after they were called, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. You must take your things to God quickly. So I appreciate, Effie came up to me. God bless you, Effie. She said, Joe, I know you're in a lot of debt now. Can I take out a loan to help you? Uh, I appreciate your heart. However, I said, God is my rescuer. Don't step in and try and be God in my life. And I meant that in a kind way. As in not a rebuke. Amen. Okay. But there is a sense of you've got to expect God to rescue you. You cannot sit and just suck your thumb. You know, when I was talking to Manny in, in the van as we were going along, I said, it's amazing. We're all joyful and we're all getting on with it and everything like that. And there are a few other miracles like how we got it all in the thing. <laughs> but I said, you know, we are now so used to dealing with problems as Christians that if you train yourself in leadership to deal with other people's problems, guess what? When you have one, you learn to deal with it quickly. Yeah. If you sit at the back of the church going, well, I don't want to be in leadership. I don't want to do this. You know who you're going to hurt? You. Yeah. You. When you get in trouble, you won't know how to react. You'll look at the leadership to come and rescue. And God went, I've been training you for this moment all of your life. I don't know the solution to our situation. But I do know how to react. That's the only bit I'm in control of. So you do your bit and God will do his bit. You know, God expects his followers to do things immediately. Jesus had no problem imposing his will on people immediately. Luke 19, 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. You know, Jesus was demanding. People come and say, Joe, you're so pushy. You know, I react. Thank you very much for the compliment. <laughs> Why? That's a Christ-like quality. You need to go in the ministry. Bro, you can't walk around telling people that. Why? <laughs> it's written throughout the Bible. Okay, you need to be a shepherd, Jesse and Liz. And let me just, I need to say this. Jesse and Liz are being trained as shepherds in the church. Okay. So when they're in a shepherd's role, like the wedding, you need to give them the respect. Yeah. Okay. That's their role. They're going to counsel the marriages. They're going to run the weddings, everything like that. So if I'm not here... And Jesse goes, hey, bro, I need you to do this, need to do this, this, and that. You need to respect. That's how it's not, they're not in a position yet, but they're in training. But you give people the respect whether they're in training or whether they're not. Are you with me, church? Yeah. But we need to demand of other people to do things. Appreciate Leslie. She said, well, I won't go in the ministry. Okay, well, you need to get a part-time job. She's got a part-time job. Come on, Leslie. You can't tell a girl to give up a career and halfway through. Why not? Come on. Why not? Without me pushing land, she wouldn't be in the ministry. Looks like she's going to go and lead the largest country in the world's salvation. 1.4 billion people. That took a lot of pushing, I seem to remember. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Jesus expected Paul to move on quickly from unopened people. Acts 22, 17. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. 
I'm going to wrap this all up. There's a lot more in here. I expect some more time. We're about to go into a big weekend. Okay. Um, Men's Day, Women's Day, and it's been wonderful. I mean, over the last two weeks, life's been going crazy for us, but it's great to see Roger and, um, and Jason baptized on the weekend. We had a wedding. We had this and that. I mean, all pretty amazing. God is in control. Amen. Let me, there's a few people. I spoke to one brother. Have you got anyone really great coming for Men's Day? No. I said, well, here's the thing, bro. Saturday morning. You know what the great thing about Christianity is? You can be in complete sin today. You can repent. You can go out and crank tomorrow night. Crank on Saturday and have a really open person. Come on Sunday and life has changed. Yeah. He was playing video games. He said, right, you're not allowed to play video games until you've met two people each day. He went, okay, that's good practical. He said, five o'clock now, go. <laughs> well, okay, I need to meet five people. Doesn't matter where you're at. Or you've got some like, you know, Millie who's got 14 million people. I'm sure Jada's got about 22 coming. I don't know. I don't know. But, or you can be on the other aspect. Whatever it is, if there's people still to come, you get on top of it immediately. At Saturday and at Sunday, you get in there immediately. You don't wait until you think somebody else might have spoken to them and might have got their number. If you sit next to somebody, you speak to somebody, you get their number and you study the Bible with them. You go, well, they're not my friend. I don't care. They're God's friend. All right? I'd rather have somebody say, well, I'm studying with Alyssa on Monday and I'm studying with Jesse on Tuesday. I'm studying with Tegan on Wednesday. Great. I'd much rather that than not be studying with them. Make sure you get in there immediately. Um, Jesus expects all his disciples to be in a constant state of urgency. Luke 12, 35. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. You know, God expects us to be in a constant state of readiness to do his work. Yeah. Yeah, that's just impossible. No, it's not. It's actually called having a repentant heart. So 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. You know, God expects you to be like, if that's the need, I'm going. He expects you, you know, you need to go to Samoa. Okay, I'm going. I'm going to China. Okay, I'm going. I'm going to do it, whatever it is, immediately. I know when you push back against God, it hurts. Been there, done it, don't do it again. It hurts. But when God is pushing you from behind and you are just, you know, trying to run with him, it's like it's so encouraging. There must be an immediate spirit. Need for an urgent spirit. Jesus made things happen immediately. It's not Joe's characteristic. It's not your disciples' characteristic. It's God's characteristic to get things done immediately. That's something you need to imitate. And God is looking for people who do things immediately. You know, it is great when people become Christians quickly. There are exceptions, and I'm not going to mention his name. Okay. <laughs> but I have to say this about Obed. Okay. <laughs> he gets a girlfriend quickly. He encourages yeah. quickly. He gets the best presents for showers, birthdays, whatever, immediately. So he may not have got it, but he sure gets it now. Okay. <laughs> That's called repentance. Okay. We need to make sure that this is part of our attitude. Why? Jesus was urgent. Yeah. He urgently prayed to get his heart right. He urgently preached the gospel. And he urgently raised from the dead. It would have been embarrassing if we were waiting for him like, so when's he? A few weeks late. Amen? What's going on? Okay. Make a decision today. Let's just focus on this week. Be urgent about getting people to Women's Day. Be urgent about getting men's to win, uh, Men's Day. And be urgent about making those people into studies. And if you're here as a Christian, not a non-Christian, what are you waiting for? Really? You think you'll have tomorrow or Saturday? One day, somebody's going to preach that, and it's not going to be a nice story. The person isn't going to be there by the weekend. Let's just make sure it's not you. Amen. Amen.